Welcome, Dr. Lippitt. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. We appreciate your time. So first, uh, to start off, could you tell us what was the motivation behind writing uh, your book, uh, Brilliant or Blunder, and what, what really motivated you to write this? I think the biggest motivation was my desire to make sure that leaders are effective. I think that the cost of errors is so extreme these days in terms of, you know, whether it's a Lehman Brothers or an Enron. If a leader really makes a blunder, it just doesn't impact his or her career impacts the whole organization. So I think that there was a desire really to help people make the smart decisions and make sure they don't fall for the pitfalls that we have found are popping up a little bit more often than normal. Normal, absolutely. So now, how does this um, kind of looking at these mindsets different from other leadership you know, models that we have or what kind of sets this apart? Well, uh, I think that what our traditional leadership models basically are looking at the leader as a personal characteristics such as integrity or courage. And then we had a, a, a period of time where we just focused on leadership style and then their competency, whether they knew how to do the job. But you'll notice that all three of those are looking at the person as the leader. And it's really not considering the context. It's not looking at the, the reality that that leader's having to face and having to detect. And in addition, the leadership models traditionally have been sort of static. Uh, we're in a very fast-changing world, very competitive world, and we really need to add a dynamic factor to leadership so that nimble decisions are made in a timely manner. So I think that makes the big difference. It's not just the personal, it is a context, a situational awareness. Okay, so how does the, the models kind of framework address that? Well, what happens is that we have a tendency to rely on our past experience and our habit. So we usually look at just one or two things, and that's what we check, and we tend to make gut reactions. And from routine decisions, the gut, the intuition, really works well. Mm -hmm. But when we're dealing with new situations or when we're dealing with very system impact uh, conditions, we really have to look at things from a comprehensive viewpoint. And that's where the six mindsets. It's sort of like asking you to do a panorama of all the things internal to the organization as well as external and do that analysis before you make a decision. It's trying to step back and make sure that we actually do the detection work rather than just rushing to a solution. So if you look at leadership from this kind of perspective, do you think that this is kind of changes the leader's role in the organization when you have this kind of more comprehensive approach? Yes, yeah. um, particularly because in the past, the leader was supposed to be the all knowledgeable person that you just, if you had a question, you go to the leader, you get the answer. I mean, it was sort of like you know a machine that you feed a question to and out pops an answer. And, and what's happening now is that a leader really cannot cope with all the complexities and we need to have this kind of inclusion. And so actually the leader's role has changed from an answer provider to a question giver and making sure that those questions get answered. So having the ability to ask the penetrating question uh, is really where leadership has to go as we move forward into greater complexity, the international aspects, the quickness with which our comp competition landscape changes. So now if we look at kind of, you know, the history of the development of the concept of, of leadership, this is really kind of making it a, a different, more agile form of, you know, of work, if you will, for the leader. Um, is this something that everyone, do you think, can um, kind of be able to do, or is this something that people can learn how to do, or how do you feel about that? I think people can learn how to do it very easily. I don't think it's, this is not limited by IQ. Okay. And it's not limited by, some people will think this is a style issue. It's not style. Uh, it, it is as practical as saying, if somebody has plans this weekend and they all of a sudden inherit $5 million, they may change their plans this weekend. <laughs> but they want to take a look at all the options that they have available to them. Okay. So I think that as soon as we learn, I have to look at this issue, I have to look at this issue and look at it from those six points. It becomes a checklist. And so it's not asking for a personality transplant. It's not asking for a major change in the way I think. It's just saying, I just want to be aware that I'm collecting all the data that's relevant before I make the decision. After I collect the data, I have to then weigh it accordingly. So, you know, it still is there's a judgment factor here, a sense of being smart about that analysis that again is different from the answer machine kind of 
rote habit response kind of relationship premise. Kind of, yeah. Okay, wonderful. So now, if you're looking at kind of the role of the leader, though, uh, with the mindset, can that help them with influencing the individuals that they're working with, and, and how, how does that happen? Well, what's really interesting is that historically, the, the idea is a leader comes up with a vision, and that his or her role then after that is just to spout the vision, compete completely, consistently, uh, perpetually <laughs> repeating uh, this new goal that, that has been uh, selected. What the mindsets do is it helps people understand that just one mindset is not going to convince the audience and that what you have to do is understand what those different perspectives are so that people are hearing something and saying, is this good in my view? And so one of the interesting things about the mindsets is that three of them basically are suggesting that we need to rapidly change, transformational quick change, that we should take risk, and that we should be focusing more externally. And historically, those are the people that are the change agents. These are the people that push change, that come up with ideas, that love change. But then we look at the fact that the change is only successful between 11 and 30 percent of the time. And you say, why is that happening? It's because that the people who like the change have to get the people who have to implement the change on board. And what they're listening for are, is this going to be internally appropriate? Are we reducing the risk? Is this going to be manageable evolutionary change? And so when a leader understands those two different mindsets, he or she then can make sure that when they speak and they discuss and they listen to concerns, that they are listening to a a mindset and understanding how to address the concern from that mindset. So it helps that leader really reach the variety of, the, of mindsets in, uh, in the audience. So really trying to help enrich the understanding of, of the context that you have to pay attention to and to all the different voices that you're, you're dealing with. Correct. Okay. I mean, I, this is, you know, Stephen Covey said, you know, seek, to, you know, seek first to understand and then be understood. Well, so you're trying to understand the audience first before you get into your routine. And I think what historically has happened is the people who like the fast change think that questions coming from the people who want to make sure things are well thought through, uh, and they label them resistors. And there, then there's a, you know, a separation that occurs, and you don't have that sense of, of teamwork and that high level of, of commitment to make the change actually happen. So instead of seeing it as a tension almost between those two, trying to see the value in both sides and being able to, to move forward, absolutely. Correct. And, and I do think that we have to basically win people over. We can't just demand that they will support something. We, we can get compliance uh, by demands. But I actually worked um, for a, a, a group, and they, he told, they told me, we're on the B team. I said, what's the B team? We be here when it starts, we be here when it ends. We're just gonna wait this one out. And I think that's part of the reason why change doesn't happen in organizations. Okay, wonderful, that's great, that's great. Now, the other connection I wanted to kind of take a look at that you actually refer to in the book, and I'd like for you to maybe uh, explain in your own words a little bit, is the connection with the mindsets and the actual organizational life cycle. You know, we talked a little bit about how it's important to understand the audience and it helps the leader in that regard, but this is really also about understanding where your organization is, as well. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, I think it's interesting that we have pretty common acceptance of the project life cycle and the product life cycle, mm -hmm. but we haven't really understood the impact of the organizational life cycle on leadership. And what happens is that different issues pop up and become more significant at different stages of the life cycle. And if you take a look at the entrepreneur who's just starting a new business, their focus is on what can I offer the market? And then they have to shape, sh uh, shift their focus to, to looking at the customers. And then there's sometimes a resistance to, to moving on as the organization needs to be more, f more professionally managed, more, have more structure, be more uh, consistent, uh, reduce the amount of chaos. And that, that shift is resisted because people say, I don't want to do that. This is our, my formula for success. And I think that is one of the reasons why we have a large number of entrepreneurs failing, because they don't understand the shift. And likewise, there's a very difficult period when you develop a, an organization. Um, you have the infrastructure. You have the processes down pat. You've got the people in place. 
and you think everything is perfect, you've had a, a wonderful track record behind you, and then you say, why should I change? And, and if someone says, you know, do you want to be the Blackberry? Or, you know, it had success, but it didn't adapt quickly. So that is, again, how do I leave behind my success to grab on to a new opportunity? And, and part of that grabbing has to be not just thinking about the product, but it also has to be thinking about the, the business model and how my business model has to change in light of what's happening with technology, with the customers, with the marketplace, everything. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to let go of success, but you, again, the, the, I guess the traditional is you don't want to be a buggy whip manufacturer. You have to keep the organization going. And I think that one of the downsides of using the term organizational life cycle is that people feel that after you hit maturity, that, that there's just a termination. They, they assume the organizational life cycle has to have the same um, termination point as the human life cycle, when in reality, organizations can last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Royal Dutch Shell is, is, is an example of a 300-year-old firm. Um, I did some work in Japan. There was a 1,000-year-old firm there. And so you know, we have to disconnect the life cycle from assuming after I reach maturity, it's just termination. You can reposition yourself. You can uh, grow again. So now, just as uh, to kind of understand your model, is that is that maybe kind of the motivation behind the wheel as opposed to having it in a graph type of form? So that kind of encouraging us to remember that this is a continual process. Correct. Yeah. And I, and I would want to caution you, the wheel is frequently presented in the book where all six are equally um, uh, given the same amount of space on the wheel. That is for the analysis. And that's when you're taking in the information. Eventually, you're going to make a decision where one or two are becoming more significant. And uh, in our research, we have 41% of the leaders focusing on one uh, priority. But that leaves uh, uh, another portion. But the point being that those others still have to be monitored because there can be something very significant happening while I'm trying to accomplish one thing, if something else presents as an opportunity or it presents as a, a major danger, a risk, I have to take a look at it. So the wheel in the book frequently is equal, but the point is that's for analysis when we get to actually the decision making. I have to choose one that's primary without be putting blinders on myself to the others. It's a continual need to look at what's happening in the organization and outside the organization. Wonderful. So um, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I would like to know if there was one main takeaway for the students to have from this book, what would you want that to be? I think um, I would like them to accept the idea that you have to be nimble by continually looking at the context. Um, again, people count, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say all those other approaches to leadership definitely add value, uh, but we really need to have a more dynamic uh, approach and one that's based on the reality that surrounds us so that we can make the brilliant decisions and avoid the pitfalls. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for joining us, My Dr. Pleasure. Lippitt. Uh, we really appreciate your time.